Good afternoon. It's Friday, the 10th of October, 2014, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish. With me in the studio, Mike Robinson. Afternoon. Uh, well, it's over to you, Mike, for the weather. Uh, indeed, because uh, the Express here reporting that uh, winter 2014 is to be the coldest for a century. Apparently, Britain is going to face Arctic weather, uh, an Arctic freeze, heavy and persistent snow. And they're alleging that... Uh, the country is going to grind to a sta standstill for up to five months. Um, and, uh, and they're saying that this is according to horrified long-range weather forecasters. So there you go. We're going to see temperatures plunge to minus 27 Celsius. Brian, what do you say about that? Well, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, happy Polish people because they're used to temperatures dropping down to the minus 30, minus 35. Get your winter woolies on, warm fur coats, lots of potato and vodka. I think we could have a great time. But isn't this global warming, Mike? Uh, that's exactly what it is. And this is a staggering uh, little article here, um, which is a joint op-ed, a joint opinion piece by uh, John Kerry and Philip Hammond, our very own uh, foreign secretary, saying that smart energy policy is a win for the world. And they're saying that, uh, you know, all this cold weather that we're getting is, of course, down to global weather, uh, global warming, sorry, and... Uh, uh, they're saying that, I'll just quote the first paragraph because I, uh, I thought it was pretty fantastic. The United States and the United Kingdom are proud of our special relationship from the struggle against fascism in the 1940s to today's fight against, to defeat the, defeat the Islamic State. We are united in common cause. Right. Right. On Thursday, that was yesterday, uh, they, will be, they will be, they were in Boston uh, and uh, uh, the place where our two countries traded the first shots of the American Revolution, but we're in Massachusetts not to remember history, but to encourage a new revolution already underway, the clean energy revolution, which is essential to winning the battle against global climate change. So they say it's a battle that they have to it's win. It's a revolution. It's a it's revolution. Good political language. Um, and, uh, and it's time to embrace the energy of the future, not to endanger good jobs, but to create them. Right. So there you go. I just think I'd have to say, um, if we, uh, Nick, if we could just bring the screenshot back up there, I'd, I'd like to say to viewers, please do not copy the example here of these firm. No hard hats. I, I don't see any safety gear. Uh, I, is I it, mean, well, what's going to fall on their heads from when they're on a roof? Well, possibly one man's going to slip and hit the other man who's standing at the top of the ladder. But, you know, I think there's some health and sa safety issues here around uh, climate change. Well, well, you are the UK column health and safety officer. So uh, well, I'm pointing it out live. I think there's been a problem there. No doubt the uh, firm will be chastised appropriately in due course. Yes. OK, moving on then. Um, we've got to congratulate UKIP. Um, Politics.co.uk saying no one is safe. UKIP's, UKIP's revolution takes Westminster. Um, they uh, obviously have won a seat. Um, but it's a course, revolution again. It is a revolution, yes. Everything comes back to change and this word revolution creeping in. So. Um, I noticed uh, the BBC in particular, their coverage of, of the thing. Of course, it was back to the old uh, photograph of Farage with his, his mouth wide, wide open and what looks like a fairly manic laugh. But also they had Douglas Carswell in a very similar pose with them both in the same photograph. It was very, very uh, cleverly chosen. Um, to uh, undermine them. Basically. Yes, yes, I believe that's the case. Um, but of course, uh, it wasn't just uh, uh, Carswell who, who did well because uh, in Hay uh, Haywood and Middleton, Middleton, sorry, uh, you kept, came very, very close um, to uh, beating the Labour candidate. Um, and, uh, well, it was just interesting to see the two uh, party leaders squirming um, because, uh, obviously, um, Labour claiming success here. But, I mean, I don't see how Labour can really claim that this result is a success for them. Um, they, uh, they haven't managed to actually significantly um, w win this seat, have well, they? Well, they've, they've got Miliband. I mean, if Miliband gets into power, we'll have our first... Marxist prime minister. That's as simple as it gets. So um, we need we need the Middleband brothers to gently be squashed to one side. Um, but uh, David Cameron obviously getting very worried because he's already back on the mantra of a vote for UKIP as a vote for for Miliband. Um, I don't think people are buying that. No. And the other thing uh, we just uh, point out that is it's obvious that a lot of um, uh, UKIP people, UKIP supporters are waking up to the reality of what's going on, the scam of politics in Westminster at the moment. So let's hope that the knowledge can be spread through UKIP 
uh, so that uh, any more people come into power, they actually know they're not up against traditional politics in Westminster. They're up against a criminal paedophile elite that seem to want to control everything. Well, where's it heading unless we uh, get to grips? Thank you very much for an overseas viewer who alerted us to this. Uh, so eagle-eyed, it's very simple. It's a job advert from uh, Reed, reed.co.uk, for an administrative, administrative support officer, a government regulator. Uh, it's paying um, 11 40 to £13.41 per hour. Um, so you say, well, you know, what's the problem with that? Well, let's have a look in a bit more detail because this is the key bit. It says that candidates will need to have experience working within the public sector, ideally uh, for a government body. Candidates with experience in the private sector cannot unfortunately be considered for this role. So this is the start of the government now recruiting for itself. It doesn't matter what your skill set is. It doesn't matter that you could be absolutely fantastic at doing your job. Unless you are government material, you can't even apply for the job mm. in the first place. So blatant discrimination by our own government in order now to choose the committee members. This is, this is absolute Sovietization of Britain. Uh, thank you very much to Holland for pointing that out to us. Well, if we've got a creeping gulag in Britain, we need to switch to the courts. And uh, this little thing says it all. It's the official uh, release of uh, Nottingham Courts, Nottingham Crown Court, in fact, for today. And at very short notice, if you have a look at the bottom, uh, Melanie Shaw suddenly brought into court. So we think that Melanie Shaw will have been woken up in her prison cell at six o'clock again uh, without any prior notice that she's going to be in court. Uh, we think she's still in court as we speak. Um, so no time for her or indeed her legal team to prepare. And of course, absolutely no notice for the public to actually travel any distance to get to Nottingham to attend this hearing. Um, so are we sure that the, that the legal team had no notice or was this, this simply placed on the court list at the, at the last possible moment so that the public couldn't attend? Uh, well, this is a very grey area, Mike, because uh, we understand from a conversation yesterday afternoon that it was Melanie's legal team that were kind enough to alert other people to the fact the case was running. But then you'd have to say, well, why did her legal team not uh, contest this very short notice pushed to get her in court, mm. and who would have been pushing to get her into court? Would that have been the Crown Prosecution Service? And so, is this understood to be a directions hearing, or what? What? Is uh, well, this? again, there was there's, there's nothing listed on that Nottingham Crown Court site, so we don't know whether it's a sort of general old boys discussion in court or it's a direction hearing. Nobody knows. So this is the key thing about Melanie's case. We don't need to get near the actual charges against her. Um, what we need simply to be reporting on at the moment is the enormous irregularities around the court procedures. Um, clearly, this lady do does not appear to be getting any form of a fair trial. Now, I want to bring these shots back up on, s on screen because uh, we were contacted by a lady yesterday. Um, who commented on them. We had shown this, which was uh, a shot of an NHS example of a leg ulcer. And the lady who contacted us said that uh, this is representative of the basic ulcer, which uh, Melanie has had on her leg, intensely painful. Uh, but what they wanted to point out was that the damaged um, uh, damaged skin and tissue around Melanie's ulcer is extensive and greatly in excess of, of the NHS image. And uh, when we've talk, talked to uh, medically trained people, they're all saying that a very deep uh, ulcer with great inflammation of the tissue around poses a real threat, uh, particularly when uh, they are caused by poor circulation and uh, vein damage. And we'll remind you again of what Sodexo said, all our prisoners have access to clinical care and appropriate medication. Well, there's something very wrong here. Now we're gonna take the step of um, putting out a little bit of what Melanie has actually been telling other members of the public. No knife for over a week to eat with, plastic cutlery 
investors' yearly di dividend. Do they know they're investigating in a corporation that abuses? So what she's saying here is they have to make do with plastic cut cutlery because this increases the profit margin. Law Lords ruling on healthcare and human rights. Their innovative rehabilitation, re rehabilitation is shakers. Instead of psychology and psychiatry, separation and cure. Uh, very vulnerable prisoners with severe mental health. The worst child sex abuse victims with slash scars all over their bodies are locked in solitary for banging their door in frustration. And then she says four suicides since April, one last month, two were the same night on the separation. She means the separation ward, I think. And it goes on here. Uh, human rights abuse, medical neglect. Um, we got the cutlery issue there. Sorry, there's a little bit of o overprint for some reason on that. Um, but uh, what she's saying is that uh, some of the prisoners have access to razors. And the lady has also um, bled and miscarried twins after she was given a contraceptive injection. So there's some really key issues over basic human rights within this Sodexo prison. And uh, I think uh, most uh, viewers will find this pretty shocking stuff. Did I read that right? Somebody that was pregnant was given a contraceptive injection and then miscarried twins? That appears to be what uh, we're being told. That, that's murder, isn't it? One would have thought so, Mike, yeah. But it, it's, it's quite clear from all the authorities, and we say again that the UK Column team have personally spoken to NHS England. Uh, we have spoken to the Ministry of Justice. We have spoken to Sodexo head office. Uh, we've also contacted um, uh, charities that say they're there to protect children, in particular NSPCC. We asked for a telephone interview with one of NSPCC's senior directors, John Brown. That has been refused. Uh, we called NAPAC that says they're there to protect child abuse uh, victims, to help them move on. They don't want to get involved. Nobody wants to get involved with a real victim, such as Mickey Summers and uh, Melanie Shaw. Uh, NAPAC's a particularly interesting uh, little organisation. All their money seems to go on salaries. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I think the figure off the top of my head is sort of over 300,000 coming in and about 290,000 disappearing in salaries. Uh, and they claim to be there to work for and with victims of sexual abuse? Well, it's not quite as clear as that because um, what they appear to indicate to me on the phone is that really they're only a contact centre that then pass victims on to other organisations to help. Um, it's, it's becoming very grey as UK Column is digging into the charity sector, huge amounts of money changing hands to protect abuse victims. But when you get into the detail of what they're doing and the money, um, very blurred indeed. So, so they just seem to be taking the, the salaries and not really doing very much, or is that unfair? Um, I think I'd rather say at this stage there are huge questions to be asked about what Britain's child abuse charities are really there for. And um, thanks again to another viewer that um, popped up with this. Um, it's the Council of Europe one in five campaign to stop sexual violence against children. And uh, when you go into this article, uh, you find here that uh, the agreement has been signed by Councillor David Mellon, um, who is part of the Nottingham City Council. Uh, in fact, he's portfolio holder for children's services for Nottingham City Council. So here's Nottingham. It's boasting that it's looking after children so well that it's teamed up with the European Union. Um, so on the right is the certificate that uh, Councillor Mellon has, has actually signed, a pact to stop sexual violence against children. But this is the same Nottingham Council that refuses to talk to uh, key victims who are now saying, why have our records been destroyed? Why, why have our records been hidden? There's something very strange going on. Sorry, that is the, just to show you, that is the signed document which you can call up on screen. So we thought we'd have a look at uh, David Mellon. And uh, here he is. This is his uh, Twitter page. Uh, nice cuddly picture of himself with a little uh, teddy bear. Uh, but when we scrolled down, we were very interested in this. He's retweeting uh, that if we scrap the Human Rights Act, we'll be in grim com company. 
And uh, what he's saying is that we're going to be equivalent to Kazakhstan and Belarus. Torture is common. Dissent is suppressed. Uh, well, we just like to say, um, isn't the reality that that is exactly what Nottingham City Council is helping to perpetuate around Melanie Shaw, who's being tortured and abused? I've used the word tortured deliberately when you really know what's happening to this lady. And she's a dissenter, isn't she? She's, she's spoken out. Indeed. The sigh. So yeah. who's going to fix this? Well, I mean, we, uh, we did see uh, David Cameron at the United Nations a week or two ago talking about uh, how anybody that's uh, really um, commenting or, or having a different view than the government on current events may be considered to be a non violent extremist or at least in some way mentally ill and in fact the liberal democrats now are really pushing this and this whole mental illness thing seems to be being pushed increasingly what what's this about brian it looks to me like they are heading towards the point of saying well if 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 you don't agree with what the government says about a particular historical event or you don't agree with government policy or you think the government is corrupt fraudulent pedophiles uh, perhaps you're mentally ill and need to be put in an institution of some kind. Is that well, this, where this is going? This is let's call, let's t call this for what it is. This is raw communism. This is the Stalin era. This is where if you criticise the government in a communist country, you're going to be dealt with. And of course, you're not dealt with by um, uh, being talked to in a nice way. If you're a real problem to the government, they lock you up in psychiatric units. And of course, this is what is now the reality under the surface of UK. We've got these people, David Cameron, Miliband, Clegg, they stand on the stage in their smart suits as if they're squeaky clean. But what they're building underneath is now this regime of you stand up and say what needs to be said, you're picked up branded mentally ill. Yeah, because sorry, just bring that back up again a second, Nick, because really, if if mental illness is something that needs to be a priority. That's something that needs to be made a priority within the National Health Service. It's not something that needs to be um, promoted to the public in this way, is it? Well, I, I, I think what we've got here is nudging, is that yeah. they are bringing mental illness into the public's mind as a part of politics. Mm. So this, this, I believe, is applied behavioural psychology where people think, well, yeah, you're right. If, if you have people who dare to speak out with ideas counter to what the government says, uh, you must be mentally ill. Mm. Um, I think we could do some checks on Cameron and uh, and um, what's what's the the other little guy that works with him? Cleggy. Clegg. Cleggy. Yeah. Mm. Well, we need to watch our politicians and what they're up to. And um, let's have a look at these two. Um, Gove, of course. Uh, remember that he stood on the stage and said that. Uh, his loyalty was not only to Israel, but to Zionism. Uh, well, we'd had him in charge of education. Um, Nicky Morgan has now taken over. Um, so what has the mail got to say on this? Well, they're, they're saying that these people are boasting that adoption has been put up by 60% in just four years as Gove's shake-up has cut all the red tape. So this is being sold as good news, more children taken away from families, and put into proper care, such as Beechwood, Nottingham, or any of the other homes in Rotherham where children have been abused. So this is happening right in front of our faces. And of course, um, we'd just like to remind people that this little organisation is, is still around. Yeah, 20, 25 years it has been around. And really, when you look back at the change and the complete destruction of Britain's institutions. Uh, it has really gathered pace in the last 25 years. Now, is that a coincidence? Uh, well, we argue that it absolutely is not a coincidence. Um, and uh, in fact, once again, let us just push this uh, um, article that's still on the front page of the UK Column website, uh, Towards a Million Change Agents, um, which is about common purpose in the NHS, among other things. Uh, and in fact, when you look at not only common purpose in the NHS, but you look at Rotherham and you look at a whole bunch of other areas around the country where there's been um, a total breakdown. You just by coincidence find common purpose uh, people in key positions in at the centre of those um, situations. Yeah, and, and of course we've had common purpose graduates involved with paedophile activity. Um, so we've had Matthew Byrne, 
who was on the advisory board um, in Merseyside. And of course, what would he have been doing? What was he doing? He was selecting other chosen leaders to come forward and work within common purpose secret networks. Um, presumably, he might have been biased to choose other paedophiles or... Well, I think this was a point you made quite a number of years ago, wasn't it, where you said uh, that if you had an organisation which was operating as a secret network, um, this would be a perfect place for paedophiles to go, actually. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think there's going to be uh, quite a major article on this subject in the, in the, in the coming UK paper. column. Yeah, which is out on Tuesday. So danger at home in UK. And um, this is really just a little bit of a filler slide, but there is so much news at the moment to do with what is happening overseas, absolutely not appearing in the British press in, in any form at all. Um, so this was sent in to us from intelnews.org, and it's saying that a, a secret Russian spy base in Syria has been seized by Western-backed rebels. Now, there's quite a lot of detail in this article. You can come in from two directions, that this is a bit of Western spin to say those nasty Russians have been uh, up to no good in Syria. Or actually, we can come in the other way and say what we've got here is evidence that uh, uh, the West is really hell-bent on taking over Syria and getting Assad out as fast as possible. So we're not going to comment much further on that, only to encourage people to uh, research as much as they can, or as much as you can yourselves, uh, to see what other people are saying about these uh, wars and all of the so-called terrorist violence uh, that David Cameron is stoking up overseas. Mm. Got to be funded, of course. Yes, yes. So um, we've got uh, RIA Novosti, Ria Novosti here. Um, and uh, I just wanted, I just thought it was amusing to, to sort of contrast um, Russian media with what's going on on this side of the uh, divide, as it were. Um, China's economy outperforms US, BRICS topples industrialized nations, according to uh, Novosti here. Um, and they're saying the new attempts to measure G so they're talking about GDP and really it's a new measurement of GDP uh, based on what's being called purchasing power parity and uh, this is um, something to do with uh, some new uh, economic measure uh, measuring the performance of nations against each other and trying to do it in a way which is <clears throat> a little more um, equal and what they've discovered is in fact uh, China is now the, large, the world's largest economy overtaking the US for the first time um, and so on. But on the other hand, um, if we uh, look at uh, Bloomberg here, um, they are absolutely pushing the, the notion that, in fact, the financial system as a whole is generally unhappy with BRICS. Uh, and as a result, of course, the speculators aren't making it too much money out of the BRICS nations. Um, but according to this Bloomberg View article here, um, they will bounce back. And they're saying uh, the downward revision of growth projections for emerging economies by the IMF and the World Bank is yet another reminder of how quickly the narrative has changed for these countries. Well, of course, what's actually going there, going on there is that uh, the IMF and the World Bank are revising growth prospects downwards because, of course, uh, Russia and China and the other BRICS countries have decided to go in direct competition with the IMF and the World Bank. So, of course, they're going to rev re revise growth uh, prospects downwards. Uh, in the hope of doing them some damage. Um, but, uh, you know, the IMF themselves absolutely recognising um, that uh, the global financial financial system, or shall we say the Western financial system now, because it's no longer global, um, is absolutely uh, stuffed. And they've released their, their latest World Economic Outlook update, and it's entitled Legacies, Clouds, Uncertainties. Uh, and they say... Quote, easy financial conditions and the resulting search for yield could fuel financial excess. Markets may have underpriced risks by not fully internal, uh, internalizing the uncertainties around the global outlook. A larger than expected increase in US long-term interest rates, geopolitical events or major growth disappointments could tr trigger widespread disruption. Now, if you can get past the language, what that basically says is we're screwed, it's going to crash and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, just, but just to give another quote from that uh, article, they say, downside risks have increased compared with the spring. The main reason is the increase in geopolitical risks, including turmoil in the Middle East and international tensions surrounding the situation in Russia and Ukraine. Also, with the baseline now reflecting increased financial market optimism, risk spread and major implied volatility indicators are close to pre-crisis uh, pre expansion lows, equity prices have continued to rise and longer-term yields have declined. 
So downside risks from a financial market correction have increased. So again, they're really, if you can get past that ridiculous language, um, they are saying that there's going to be war and there's a crash coming. Um, so what can you say about that? That's from the words of, that's from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, they don't like what the BRICS are doing. No. So we've got trouble with the economies. Um, we're all being collapsed, but of course we've still got money for fighting wars and mm. anti-terrorism measures. Mm. Yes. Extraordinary. Well, um, we have got a UK column exclusive. I would say stay glued to your, um, I wouldn't say television set there, Mike, but of course it's computer screens. Because we're not a television channel. Because we're not a television-like channel. Uh, but we really have got an exclusive here, and I think it's uh, going to make a huge impact on the country. Uh, but a few days ago, we became aware of um, the erection of some rather strange, uh, um, some strange things. Uh, we weren't sure what we were looking at, um, but we can now tell you in great detail what is unfolding in Plymouth. And so the UK column is running an exclusive here that David Cameron has been briefing NATO on ISIS missile launches in Plymouth. And uh, we understand that he was having a particularly close uh, conversation with uh, Angela Merkel on this one. Um, but the situation uh, became worse within the space of a few hours and this resulted on an actual attack. Uh, we've got a picture here. This is a shock ISIS attack on Plymouth. Uh, taking place in Plymouth. Let us explain this to you because David Cameron has been uh, talking about this with Cobra. Uh, this is clearly the rocket trail and we can see the trajectory here um, in a uh, geographical sense. This is uh, moving from east to west. Uh, higher in the sky we've got an earlier rocket trail and uh, of course what we can establish here is that uh, it's linked to the flag on Plymouth Life Centre which has apparently now been renamed the Death Center by ISIS. And the conclusion is that uh, the rockets were launched somewhere from the edge of the local park. And of course, the impact was uh, directly on UK column offices. Now, we can report that surprisingly, despite this uh, vicious attack, everybody in the building is feeling remarkably good. Uh, but of course, we are aware of... Um, uh, the situation around David Cameron and of course what the British public is being told we should be terrified of but trust David. Well I'm afraid the news is uh, even worse uh, than we ha might have anticipated because um, uh, David Cameron has proposed some new ISIS anti-terrorism measures. Uh, he has said that anyone wearing black items of clothing will be considered a possible terrorist. Anyone wearing black with red, air, red underwear will be considered a probable terrorist. Uh, anyone wearing black with red underwear and a black beard will be a nearly certain terrorist. And this is key. All funerals must be notified to SO15 in advance to avoid a police armed response. Uh, city parks are be, to be monitored by CCTV with ongoing stop and search. Runners uh, from stop and search will be shot. Black flags are going to be made illegal and those flying them will be imprisoned. We believe that's going to be Peterborough. And uh, all jokes, cartoons and laughter criticising David, our King Cameron's black policies will, of course, become illegal. Black humour is now considered to be a hate crime linked to ISIS. And uh, the British Army Black Watch, this is probably good news, is to be reinstated to watch black. Um, I do I have one more, okay. if I may. We've just added it there to the bottom. Black Mass has been approved for use on board British warships. Now, that's going to be immune from any change. And uh, finally, uh, Angela Merkel, who's widely known as the Black Widow of German politics, she is going to stay the same. But basically, black is, is going to become white. Right. Um, I do see a problem with number one. Anyone wearing black items of clothing? Mm. Uh, do you? What's yeah, that? police. Police. Ah. OK, we'll have to think about that one. But um, uh, I'm sorry it's UK column that's brought this bad news to the country. We're simply saying we think that the British public should be having a good long, hard think at what we're being told by Westminster. Uh, who is really our enemy? Who is really our friends? And should we trust uh, David Cameron and the present Conservative government? 
about as much as uh, weapons of mass destruction, mm, I think. I think so. Well, there we are. Right. Um, okay, well, Wales uh, is looking at uh, devolution options, moving on to constitutional issues, um, because, uh, of course, Scotland had their chance to look at uh, devolution options. Um, Wales is now looking at that. But unfortunately, according to the FT here, um, it, they have more of a problem because uh, really they don't have the they don't have the, po the the political clout to hold Westminster to uh, ransom the way that the Scottish did. So it's highly unlikely that uh, Welsh nationalists are going to get any kind of referendum. But this is just more um, of a push to try and get the country split up. Um, and, but meanwhile, in Scotland, the Smith Commission um, is uh, well. Parties are to submit devolution power plans to the Smith Commission today. Now, the Smith Commission has been set up uh, to implement what's being called Devo Max. Um, this is the new round of powers which are going to be devolved from, from Westminster to the Scottish Government. Uh, and this is the day that uh, independent supporting parties um, have to are getting the chance to demand that. Um, now, of course, this, uh, this thing, this, um, what do you call it, uh, report, which is going to eventually come out as being called the Smith Commission, is being led by Lord Smith of Kelvin, um, and he was tasked by David, Gav uh, David Cameron with uh, delivering more devolved powers to, uh, following the referendum. Uh, and, uh, well, I mean, who is this Lord Smith and what, what is he about? Well, if we look at his, his own um, biography on the Smith C Commission uh, website. Uh, he doesn't seem to have any kind of ego at all here. Um, Lord Smith of Kelvin is one of the UK's most experienced and senior chairman, having led organisations in the private, public and third sector, according to this. Uh, most recently, Robert chaired the organising committee for Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games and currently chairs the UK Green Investment Bank and SSE. He's also Chancellor of the University of Strathclyde and Director of the Standard Bank Group. A chartered accountant by profession and formerly president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland. He's held a number of executive roles in financial services and had been a governor of the BBC and chairman of Children in Need, chairman of the National Museums of Scotland, chair of Glasgow's Riverside Museum Appeal, vice chair of, of Kelvin Grove Appeal. He also chaired the process which produced the Smith Report on guidance for, for audit committees, chaired the Smith Group advising the Scottish Government on young people not in education, employment or training. And last year he chaired the committee which produced the Code of Governance for Higher Education in Scotland. Um, so that's who's uh, um, pushing this, uh, this latest round of, uh, or at least uh, compiling the list of, of powers that, that Scottish um, um, MP, um, MSPs want to have devolved from Westminster uh, as yet another um, sort of removal of... Um, Sovereignty from the UK to with a totally establishment man. I mean, yes. you, you can't go through those. Does he ever get off his chair? Do you think with that list, I don't see how I possibly could. Yeah, yeah. Um, which of course brings us again to the conference. Please uh, do come to this. Um, we've got this massive push for uh, constitutional change and quote democratic reform. Um, lots about this in the upcoming UK column newspaper as a as a wet for for, uh, for the um, conference itself. 1st of November in the uh, Ramada Birmingham Sutton Coffee uh, Hotel and of course on the 2nd um, is a second conference this time on the issue of health. Uh, all the details at doomwatch.biz. As I say, if you are um, interested in coming to that, please make sure that you're uh, logged into the uh, BCG or UK column websites if you're a member in order to take advantage of any discounts available. Um, and well, that's that. That's that. Well, um Let's uh, just have a look at this gentleman. Danny Bamping has um, been hitting the news big time today with BBC. And Danny um, came to notice in Plymouth and indeed across the country uh, when he won Dragon's Den with uh, one of his toys, uh, which I, th I think was the Bedlam Cube, if I remember correctly. Yeah, puzzle might be a better puzzle. one. Puzzle, yeah. Okay, the Bedlam Puzzle. And... Um, he turned down the money for, from Dragon's Den because he wasn't uh, quite sure whether that was such a good offer or not. Uh, but nevertheless, he, he got up front, he won the thing. Why are we interested in Well, Danny has been taking on Plymouth City Council and uh, basically he um, has uh, had a very bad time with uh, bailiffs coming to his house and uh, he's now taken on Plymouth City Council saying that uh, what they did was illegal 
And as a result of uh, Plymouth City Council making him bankrupt, um, as a result of non-payment of council tax, uh, he's now claiming that actually this has cost him a vast amount of money because it collapsed his, his whole business. Um, so there's a couple of num interesting things uh, coming to light. So first of all, he said, well, basically you've collapsed business. Um, um, but basically he stopped paying council tax in 2009, saying it was in protest at landlords of student occupied properties who are exempt. Now, this is quite a hot potato, certainly in Plymouth, but in other cities uh, where we have those who pay council tax and those that don't. And uh, more and more people in Plymouth providing student, student accommodation, very big profits, but they don't pay council tax. Um, so he took on the council and very quickly Plymouth City Council got heavy handed. Um, so Danny maintains that he suffered significant injustice and put in a letter of claim against the authority saying he doesn't want to take anyone from the council to court but he, he thinks he deserves a financial remedy. Now, what is significant is that Danny Bamping was able to actually prove um, that Plymouth City Council was hiring uh, the Plymouth courts to progress its council tax claims. And at Danny's uh, hearing that we were actually present at, um, there were about 2,000 claims. I think it might, might have been as high as 2,400 claims. Um, the magistrate actually walked out of the court um, abandoned the court, um, but nevertheless the claims were then processed against uh, those that uh, the council alleged had not paid. So Danny was able to expose this. He was also able to, has also been able to show that of course that we have a city council hiring the courts and effectively the court staff in order to um, take money from people. So Danny, a very big campaigner. We're going to say well done Danny. And we look forward to seeing how that particular case unfolds. So we'll bring you back to the, well, I'm not going to say the rocket attack. I'm going to bring you back to what was really happening, which was a massive rainbow. Uh, so massive, in fact, that there were four reflections in the sky, although we couldn't capture them all on screen. And we wanted to leave you with a little bit of a reflective thought that we shouldn't be thinking about ISIS. We think we should be thinking about Genesis 9, 13 and 17. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. So we just like to leave you. Uh, for the weekend with a little bit of reflection uh, that as well as battling against uh, men, uh, corrupt men, corrupt politicians, we perhaps need to think also of a little bit of a battle on a spiritual level. Um, 6 p.m. this evening, do join us for Doomwatch. Patrick Henningsen is, is on for R1, and then we're, we believe that uh, Ginny God Goddard, who's president of the Complementary Medical Association, will be on with Alex uh, for R2. Um, and so join us six until eight this evening, ukcolumn.org slash live. Brilliant. And don't have nightmares about ISIS attacks in Plymouth because it was a little bit of black humour. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.